Hello, I'm Simon Owens, and you're listening to The Business of Content, a podcast about how publishers create, distribute, and monetize their digital content. In this week's episode, we're talking about two star Wall Street Journal reporters who quit their jobs to launch their own media company. During their combined 20 years at the Wall Street Journal, Bradley Hope and Tom Wright covered some of the most momentous stories to hit the financial world, but none were as consequential to their personal careers as their reporting on Joe Lowe, a Wharton grad who was caught stealing billions of dollars from investment funds. Their dogged investigation led to the publication of the book Billion Dollar Whale, an instant bestseller that transformed them into A-list writers on par with Michael Lewis and Malcolm Gladwell. Rather than simply returning to their newspaper jobs, they partnered on a new media entity called Project Brazen. Unlike most digital media companies, Project Brazen has no ambitions to churn out large quantities of web content. Instead, it only focuses on ambitious investigative storytelling that can be adapted into multiple mediums that include podcasts, books, film, and television. How does Project Brazen go about vetting and staffing these projects? And what are the best ways to monetize serialized storytelling? Those are some of the questions I put to co-founder Bradley Hope in today's interview. Before we jump into the discussion, I want to talk about this episode's sponsor, Video Husky. If you're like many video creators, editing is your least favorite part of the creative process. That's because it's usually the most time-consuming part. You're probably spending countless hours scrubbing through a massive backlog of footage, monotonously piecing them together in post-production. Or you're paying an exorbitant amount of money to a video production agency in exchange for subpar work. So think about this. What would it mean if you could get back those hours spent editing your own videos? Video Husky has created a very streamlined, cost-efficient method for editing video. By hiring Video Husky, you're not just getting a video editor, you're also getting a project manager who oversees the entire workflow of your editing requests, access to a project management dashboard where you can communicate with your editing team and monitor the status of your edits, vast libraries of licensed stock footage, music, and motion graphic assets to spice up your videos, and a proven systematic process of editing videos that's worked for hundreds of creators. Video Husky will also conduct a free consultation over Zoom with you that will assess your needs and recommend the best editing package for you. Go sign up for your free video editing consultation at videohusky.com. That's V-I-D-E-O-H-U-S-K-Y dot com. I'll leave a link in the show's description. Okay, on to my interview with Bradley. Hey, Bradley, thanks for joining us. Thank you. It's a pleasure. So you're one of those star journalists who were able to leverage their stardom to go off and launch their own media company. How did you get started off in journalism? I, you know, I, I'm like one of the last completely old fashioned journalists. I, I worked at my school newspaper at NYU, and I actually spent all my time at that school newspaper. I, I barely went to class. And then I did an internship that led to a, a daily police reporting job at the New York Sun. And then I went to the Middle East where I reported for a, a local English paper over there before ending up at the Wall Street Journal. So I, I basically spent my entire career doing very kind of traditional newspaper journalism jobs. Yeah. And that, that reminds me of, uh, I don't know if you know, R.W. Apple, who's now dead, but was one of the last, uh, you know, old school journalists. And I, I forget which Ivy League school he went to, but he had kind of like a same, similar trajectory where, you know, basically he grew so obsessed with his his uh, college newspaper that I think he either failed out or came close to completely failing out of college because he was so obsessed with that. And so you were you and I and I'm kind of of that generation slightly, too, as I graduated college, you know, right before the Great Recession first job was in a, at a print news uh, newspaper and kind of worked my way up from there. And I feel like probably that that kind of trajectory is becoming more rare. Yeah, I think it is very rare now. I mean, a lot of and, and also the problem is that a lot of the kind of journalism skills that you learn during that traditional route are really important. And if you if you do it from a kind of faster digital first place, I just feel like you might not capture all those same skills, you know? Oh yeah. I mean, those like, in terms of like my college education, it's almost useless compared to those first two years as a print journalist where I've probably learned more in two years than I have in any kind of similar time span 
um, over, you know, the rest of my career. Like it just really throws you into the thick of it and you just have to learn very quickly how to do journalism. Yeah, totally. I mean, also just that, that feeling of, you know, I remember my first day at the New York Sun, the editor told me, uh, okay, here's your chance. Write this story, get it to me in three hours. If it's any good, it's going to run on the front page. If it's not any good, you're probably not going to write for the paper anymore. You're just going to be sitting on your heels for the rest of your internship. <laughs> wow. So you eventually made your way to the Wall Street Journal. What was your official beat there? I started off with a very intense financial beat. I was hired. I was luckily hired by somebody I had met um, at a previous newspaper, and he sort of convinced the journal to hire me despite the fact that I had no real financial background. And of course, as typical in the Wall Street Journal, they threw me on the most kind of like arcane financial beat, which was um, the exchanges, market structure, and high-speed trading, which, was, you know, you may have heard of that book, Flash Boys by Michael Lewis, yeah. that kind of uh -huh. stuff. Wow. And so, like, what, was it just like feeling like you're almost drowning for the first year or so as you're trying to just learn these, like, complex mechanisms? Well, just like the New York Sun, I remember the first day I arrived on the on the way up in the elevator, they told me that in about an hour and a half, I'd have to interview the the head of one of the exchanges, a person I'd never even heard of, and and write a story. You know, so that's that's very much the kind of traditional newspaper experience. Um, I I felt a little bit out of my element at first, but eventually I just you know with with all beats, the most important thing is to actually bring your own kind of perspective to it. It's not about um, it's about, you know, finding what you find interesting in it. And so eventually I, I started to find those kinds of stories. Um, and then the big change for me, though, is in the midst of doing that, um, this 1MDB scandal broke out and I read Tom Wright's initial coverage and it, it had a lot to do with Abu Dhabi, which is a place I lived for three years. And it's, it's kind of a rare person to meet who's lived in Abu Dhabi for three years. Um, why, and, did, why did you live in Abu Dhabi for three years? So I worked at this newspaper there called The National uh -huh. when it started up. It was an English okay. language newspaper. Uh -huh. And um, and so I just jumped into that story with Tom. And eventually the two of us became sort of the lead 1MDB reporters. And, 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 they, took me, and I, they took me off my beat and I never covered it again. And so what, so what is that scandal? So the 1MDB scandal is this sort of just awe-inspiring global um, corruption scandal where basically... Um, a, a, a plucky young um, Malaysian financier managed to convince the prime minister to create a new sovereign wealth fund, like a kind of government investment vehicle, and proceeded to borrow billions and billions of dollars at that sovereign wealth fund. And then he was stealing the money through this kind of quite complex se series of, of frauds. And then going on a global spending spree that involved Leonardo DiCaprio. They funded the Wolf of Wall Street with this with the stolen money. They were having you know crazy parties in Hollywood. They were buying real companies with the money as well. I mean, it was just a crazy story. And you worked on this with another reporter who later became your business partner, right? Yeah, that's Tom Wright. Uh huh. And so it sounds like from what you're saying is the Wall Street Journal was like you know your current beat. That's no longer your beat. Your entire beat is this story. Yeah, that's basically what happened because it, it started off with, okay, you can take a break from your beat for, you know, a month. And then it just kept going to the point where I just never, I never looked back again. And then eventually I was doing, before I left, I was doing kind of what I consider global enterprise. So it was, it was projects that were investigative in nature, uh, international and kind of cross country and it involved multiple reporters or teams of reporters. And so I was doing a lot of that kind of thing. So that's what it kind of evolved into. Yeah. And it seems like there's like, I don't know if it's a current moment or if it's always been this way. There's this fascination with fraudsters. You think about Firefest, you think about Theranos and stuff like that. Did you find that there was a similar kind of public fascination with this story? Well, as 1MDB was sort of unfolding, I think the average reader couldn't quite follow it because it was really complicated and it was hard to say everything that we knew because we, we needed to be able to say it without any doubt. And eventually... Um, when our book came out, then people suddenly realized, whoa, this is actually the craziest story I've ever heard, you know, and um, the details of the parties, which were just unbelievable, you know, they, they just involved sometimes, they, you know, one classic story where they they decided they wanted to experience New Year's twice. So they 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 got every flew everybody to Las Vegas. They got on a 747 that had been converted into a casino. They flew it to Australia experienced New Year's and the countdown in a, on like a series of yachts 
uh, in off of the harbor of Sydney. Then they got back on the 747, raced faster than the sun was setting, <laughs> and landed in Las Vegas where they went to a club and then they experienced the countdown again. You know, they just did lots of crazy stuff like that. And that's not even the most expensive one, you know? And so how did it like morph? Was it just you, you, you had worked on a bunch of these stories and you guys decided just put to get pitched together and pitched it to a book publisher? Like how did the book deal come about? Well, you know, the, the, the important thing is it's actually the same thing with Theranos and, and 1MDB is the same. When you read the day to day coverage, you really can't get a good grasp of it. Because I, I know this from the outside. I read the Theranos coverage and then I read the book and I was like, oh, my God, this is so much crazier and worse than I than I thought. And I had read all the stories in the in the newspaper. So there's something about at the end of a big project like that, it needs this kind of like completely start from scratch, understand the story kind of from the human characters level. And obviously a newspaper, especially the Wall Street Journal, you're you're restricted in how much you can write. You know, you you have about two thousand words for a long story in the journal. And then 500 words of it is, is people saying, declined to comment, denied they had done anything wrong and all that sort of thing. So you, you really lose the kind of narrative um, abilities that you do in a book. So it was, it was natural that we wanted to do it. And we just had a conversation with somebody that I actually knew in the book publishing world, this, a great editor called Paul Whitlatch. And he saw the vision of it and he just, he, he, got, us, he got us going. And what was the name of the book? Billion Dollar Whale. And when was it published? That was published in 2018. And what was the impact of the book to your careers? I think that was, it, it made it made things, uh, it, it made a big impact on our careers. I mean, both of us, uh, it really, you know, anytime you write a book, um, it, and I always recommend journalists try to write books, because it really does change your career, because it just shows you're capable of putting together something that's, you know, just so much bigger than an article. And, and the kind of reporting, you know, I would say a couple of the interesting impacts. One of them is the sources that I made and that I met during the 1MDB investigation have kind of gone on to inform all the work I do ever since. You know, these are all the people that are on, on either end of the spectrum. They were either the kind of law enforcement good guys or they were the truly the co-conspirators of Joe Lowe. All of them have really led us onto some amazing stories, including um, Tom just put out a podcast last year called Fat Leonard, um, and that that connection was made by somebody that came from the 1MDB world, you know, um, mm -hmm. to Leonard himself. So there's just so many different ways that a book can change your life, to be honest. Well, did it also kind of open, this is kind of segueing into what you guys launched next, did it also open your eyes in terms of like strong IP and how that that like opens a lot of doors? Because I'm imagining, you know, you became wanted on the speaker circuit. I'm assuming like Hollywood wanted to option it. Maybe somebody wanted to make a podcast about it. What, what did that, how did that affect your thinking about IP and and what, what you could do from a more ambitious storytelling point, standpoint? I think that that was definitely the first moment I ever even heard the phrase IP. You know, I had never really even thought about it. Um, yeah. So yeah, our book was optioned at the time, and it's now in in in, in on its way to becoming a limited um, TV series. So um, that that really introduced us to the world of Hollywood and how that process works, and and the kind of value that Hollywood attaches to authentic, true stories like that. Um, and also, yeah, the public speaking as well, because there's a business aspect to it, it was also there was a lot of opportunities. Um, actually, mostly Tom did that, though, because he left the journal not that long after the book came out, whereas I stayed for a couple more years. And so when did you guys start discussing about launching your own production slash media company? Ever since Tom left the journal, we were always talking about ideas and, you know, we had so many iterations of what we could do. We thought we could work at a company like we could actually work at a company that, you know, and be part of that, you know, set up something new within somebody else's company. And, and the more, every time we took a step forward towards doing one of those things, we just got more confident about just doing it ourselves and figuring it out. And, you know, I think we, we try to take a very journalistic approach to business, which is we don't take deals. We, we kind of investigate them. And, and, and if we, the more you investigate them, the more you realize that there's a lot of smoke and mirrors and that you could probably do it better yourself, you know, and, and that's how we became so independent along the way. We kept saying no to deals and we keep saying no to deals to this day. And so you launched something called Project Brazen. When did that officially launch? That was about, um, a little bit less than a year ago. I think it was like March, 
Um, and Project Brazen was our code name for our 1MDB investigation because there was a company in the in the constellation of offshore companies called Brazen Sky, which always sounded like a very poetic company to be used right. in a fraud. And so we called it Project Brazen. And so the company acts more like a production studio, right, than a traditional media company. Yeah, I mean, in some ways, I think of it uh, as just a, a a content origination company, you know, like, so everything we're, we're, we're not like for hire. So someone couldn't come along and say, Hey, I have an idea. Can you guys make this for us? That's not really what we're doing. That's not our model. Our model is to, we have a huge list of projects we want to do and we figure out how can we make those in a sustainable way, you know, that we can pay our bills and, you know, pay, pay for the cost of it and potentially profit so that we can grow and do more projects in the future. And so the way that you're kind of approaching it is that you are both star writers and now podcasters and stuff like that. So you're creatives in your own, like you're doing your own projects that are where you guys are doing the most of the heavy lifting, but the eventually, or pro you're probably already in the process of it. The idea is that you will use your fame and connections to pull in other talent to create their own storytelling projects, right? Well, I would put it a little bit differently. You know, for, first of all, our first two projects are one podcast that was called Fat Leonard that came out last year. Where really that, was, that was Tom Wright who did that one, yeah. or who at least hosted it. Yeah, Tom Wright yeah. hosted that. He did all the interviews. He edited it. And he was really huh. the, the key man for that. Then mm -hmm. I'm working on a book uh, that I hope will come out later this year. And so those were our first two projects. And we really think of ourselves as somewhat platform agnostic, you know, like we still like books, we still like audio books and other things and other kind of interesting ways to get stories out. But we, we don't think that our fame or, or whatever, if there is any fame that we have, we don't think that's going to draw anyone in to help or to come work with us. What we think is important is we have a kind of a vision is which is that there's no longer such a need for intermediaries out there. Journalists, we, you, know, you see it all the time now, journalists you know, starting their own newsletters, things like that. I, I think that's not the most sustainable model. But what we want to create is a company that allows journalists to, to, to have a partnership. So they're not an employee necessarily, but we can help provide some cushion so they can still pay their bills and whatever. But they, they benefit proportionally to the success of their work. And I think that's such a powerful thing. You know, journalists aren't um, money obsessed people. So that's not the most important thing. I think the most important thing is to have a lot of creative freedom to be able to kind of pursue things outside of a bureaucratic structure. They want to be attached to something that they start. You know, they don't want to be like taken off of it or told to do something else. Um, and they want to be able to experiment and and kind of not have somebody who's a kind of an older person who's higher ranked overrule them or cut the budget or whatever it might be. And so we want to create that kind of really creative partnership with journalists. And, and, and we're even open to the idea of some journalists creating an entirely different separate brand um, as part of our kind of group. It doesn't have to be a Project Brazen project. Like if somebody had something that was really compelling, a kind of worldview, we could support them to create that within our group. You know, so I think that's kind of our our approach is that we don't want to we don't want to be part of anybody else's media empire. We want to be um, a, a kind of like journalistic journalistic kind of collective in some ways. Um, but at the same time, we're commercially minded. We're not trying to do it just as a kind of nonprofit. Yeah, and this is what I've called in my newsletter Creator Economy 2.0. It's like the first 1.0 is is this really hard life of trying to launch a Substack or a podcast or a YouTube account on your own and just like build it block by block into a business which involves a lot of runway and a lot of risk and everything like that. And I think there are a lot of these new companies like yours, like Workweek, like Defector Media that are like, okay, let's pull our resources, maybe even get some funding so that we can provide, you know, some kind of stable salary or upfront advance that will allow them to, to take away some of the risk, but they still have some of the creativity and the upside. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think, you know, what you're going to see, I, what I hope to see and what I think is happening, and I think we're among the first to do this, is to find independent financing to make things. So if you if you go to a, a company that works in the audio space, they've already got this figured out. They're trying to buy from you 
at the cheapest rate they can something that they can turn turn and sell to somebody else for a lot of money or or in some cases they think that they can make advertising revenue you know that that's that's far and above what what you could you know what 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 you think that they're going to make right I think what you're going to see, and you see this in the film and TV industry, like I just saw an article the other day about the Russo brothers um, receiving, they sold like a 40% stake of their company to a a non-Hollywood kind of company. It was actually a gaming company. Mm -hmm. And and you've seen the the story with um, Reese Witherspoon selling to that enterprise. So I think this is what could, could happen and should happen in podcasting, which is independent financing that allows a podcast maker the freedom to make what they want and to kind of command better terms, you know? And so that's what we've done. We've, we created, so with Fat Leonard, we convinced investors to lend us the money to make it. And they were very happy with the outcome so far. So then we were able to take that and turn it into a kind of a fund. So we have a fund now that is behind Project Brazen that essentially allows us to make anything we want to make over the next couple of years. Um, and obviously it's it's a... It's, a, it's something that we have to be very pr- prudent about because we're we're trying to we're not just spending that money with with no <laughs> with no hope of getting it back. We have to try to earn the money back and earn profits, you know. But I think that's going to be a really exciting thing in podcasting is independent financing. There's been a few experiments. There was a fund out in California called PodRev, which I found a really a, a brilliant structure. But I'm, I'm hopeful there's going to be a lot more of that. PodRev? I've, I mean, I know of PodFund. This is something different. Oh, sorry. PodRev is the is this style of of the return. It's called the mm-hmm. PodFund, and they use something called PodRev. Oh, okay. Uh-huh. And uh, so, so, I mean, this is like traditional just investing, right, for yours? Like someone, uh, you've got some people to invest, they get equity. And if there's an equity, if there's an exit, they get paid out, right? No, actually, our fund is a debt fund. So, so, so people are lending us money. Oh, and okay. it, it, lending us money and there's some like unique characteristics to how it works but essentially it's a debt fund it's kind of like this would be hard to get as debt from a bank but but private investors have a different risk appetite and there's you know you, you, and the, the truth about finances and I'm not saying that I've taken any training in this but I've only just used my journalistic skills to kind of think about it and try to be creative about it is you can invent anything there's no reason why it has to be done some certain way and 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 that's true as well. When you when you've got a podcast, it doesn't have to be sold to somebody, some big company. You know, that's that's just a myth. And then, so the way that you work is you don't claim that you're handling every piece of the production. I'm guessing with your book that came out under Project Brazen that you actually did it through a traditional publisher. I think Fat Leonard was done in partnership with PRX. Like you, you were thinking strategically about partnerships so that you're not, you know, handling everything, right? Yeah. And actually we're, we're not even against selling a podcast to a bigger company, but we're not going to do it under duress. We're not going to do it because we need the money from them. We're going to do it because the deal makes sense. They have something that they're, they're really excited about it. They want to make it work in this way, and we think it's good for us to do it that way. And so PRX is an amazing company where, which is very creator friendly. And so we have a we distributed Fat Leonard with them, and we're hoping to work with them on our future podcasts. We also work with a really great um, physical production company called Audiation in New York that are helping us with the the physical production of our podcasts. And so with uh, with Fat Leonard, tell me about that, like in terms of what was the release like? How did you monetize it what was your kind of approach on that front so you know um it's it's, it is difficult to start from zero so so we we managed to make the podcast very quickly we made we made it we we did the interviews we produced it completely and had it out within about six months actually from when we started which is a very fast turnaround again it's actually possible to do that when you're fully in control you know when you're not having to rely on somebody else to kind of step forward and so tom really just did all the work that he could possibly do and we had our own financing so we could we could just move as quickly as we needed to um the 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 podcast kind of launched it had a a good a good start but really it's it's picked up amazingly in the last in the last um 2 months now and that's for a couple of reasons one of them is again if you if you take the marketing into your own hands it can be scary. It can be overwhelming. But, you know, first of all, you can hire great people. We hired a company that we work with called The Right Now in California to help us with publicity. But we also worked with Vice to do a short 10-minute documentary about the Fat Leonard case where they kind of really prominently promoted the podcast. That had a huge impact. 
We also had a kind of <laughs> unexpected publicity, which was that we were subpoenaed um, by a federal judge for our tapes in that interview uh, because the defense, the defendants in that case um, believed that they should listen to the full interview so that they could potentially impeach Leonard as a witness. He's the key witness against them. And we actually had to f- hire our own First Amendment lawyers to fight that. And we actually lost because in the way that the way the Constitution works is that somebody's right to a fair trial ultimately trumps um, journalistic protections. Mm-hmm. Ultimately, we, we're we not too worried because the only thing that was sought in the subpoena was the tapes of interviewing Leonard. And we made the... the which were on of, the record. Which were on the record and which were meant for public consumption. Um, mm-hmm. We didn't like the idea of being forced to do it. So instead, we actually um, dropped all of those interviews, which is more than 20 hours, into a public Dropbox. And said, anybody who wants to listen to this, if you're a scholar if you're a journalist, whatever it might be, have a listen. And if you're also, if you, if you're, if you're a defense counsel, feel free, you know? Yeah. And it's, I've heard that it's hard to monetize some of these like limited series because you don't know, you can't tell advertisers in advance what the audience is and stuff like that. How are you hedging against that? Like some, some that you're seeing more networks now, rather than launching new feeds, every time they have a prestige podcast, they're creating like, singular feeds where they treat each uh you know limited series as a different season different stuff like that yeah we're, we're definitely doing that like so so fat leonard ran as a as the first podcast in project brazen originals we're gonna have two other shows running in that feed later on this year so so we are thinking about things like that so you know we see it as there's two kinds of podcasts there's advertising projects and there's ip projects we we want to make shows that are great to listen to as as amazing journalism so we're not like, you know, we're not trying to craft the story to fit into one of those buckets, but they end up in one of those buckets. And sometimes there's a blend of the buckets, sometimes there's both. So Fat Leonard is having a good advertising start, but ultimately we are trying to negotiate a deal to do it as a film uh, or a television series. And another thing that we're trying to do differently is rather than just optioning things, which is very common, if you make a podcast, you immediately start getting inundated with these requests Are the rights available? Are the rights available? If you just option something like that and and don't think it through, you can easily not have something made. You know, so we're we're really trying to understand the partners that we're coming to. We're we're willing to actually reinvest in the projects. So like that means um, pay for part of the screenwriter ourselves just to keep the our involvement at a really high level and and throughout the process. You know, so that's that's kind of our model. Yeah, and a lot more companies are doing this. It used to be like Condé Nast, they would sell the rights to a article that would get turned into a movie, but now they have Condé Nast Entertainment, which is like, we want to be producers on the movie. And so you want to have like a very active role uh, for all that adaptations. Yeah, exactly. And and, and even some of our projects, like we, we could um, sell the the rights to make a documentary to someone but if we think there's such a great documentary to be made why don't we make it you know so that's mm-hmm. where that where that's where our platform agnostic nature comes into it you know we think we can find the teams find the people the partners to work with and do it ourselves and do you think and this has been a criticism against the magazine industry i think the baffler or somebody published about this um like does that mean so talk to me about like picking new projects like do, when you're like hearing a pitch for a narrative podcast or a book or something like that or a documentary is something at the back of your mind is, is like what kind of other ip can be drawn from this can this be a tv show can this be a movie you know what I I would say it's it's dangerous to to start with that as your discussion point. I think the first thing that I think about is how excited do I feel about this story? If the story is so compelling and exciting, things could start to fall in place just because of that. You know, like maybe you don't have a pathway to make it into a film or something right away, but 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 is this a really exciting thing? Does it feel like it hasn't been done? Is the person who's going to make it are they are they a really unique voice like you know what kind of other work have they done those are the kinds of things i think about first and then i start to plan more around the business side later you know i think that's a really good way to kind of winnow things down Mm -hmm. and so like talk to me about picking new projects Uh, what are you guys working on that's not you know by you and and tom well, we're not ready to announce any of those projects yet, but essentially we have our originals feed. That's for like really sort of high quality 
journalism, um, you know, that that is investigative and kind of globe trotting. So we've got two projects in that space that they're actually our own projects. They're not from other people. Then we're, we're, we're trying to create some other franchises that are around um, some of the themes that we like. Like, so one of those is kind of in the intelligence world. And we want to do um, sort of spy stories and, and stories from that world that are kind of totally unexpected. Not, not like another Cold War story that's retold through, you know, actors or whatever, but, but really brings something fresh and unique and, and strange and interesting angles to those stories. Um, we're interested in doing, in general, we're interested in stories that have this kind of international feel. I'm based in London. Tom's in Singapore. Um, you know, I'm a longtime Middle East foreign correspondent. He's a longtime Asia correspondent. You know, now I live in England. Anyways, we, are, we have a very international perspective. And we also believe that some of the most exciting growth are audiences that may consume things in English, um, uh, but also they, they want to have that kind of international feel. You know, like there's, if, if you come along with a true crime story from like New Orleans, I, I think that's a crowded space, you know. But if you came, on, came along with a true crime story from Germany, I think that would be pretty exciting, you know, because we haven't heard stories like that. There's a, there's a, lot, there's a huge dearth of international content that's of a high quality. And so that's where we're really focusing a lot of our efforts. And we are, we're, we're going to experiment this year with a, a dual language project. So it, we're doing it in two different languages, and it's a, it's a real partnership between the two sides that I think yields something more than just two podcasts. It makes two better podcasts as a result. Are you taking pitches or are you more just like, uh, you know, just leveraging your own connections? We're definitely taking pitches. Um, and and you know, if people listen to Fat Leonard and feel like they can see this kind of thing we're interested in, then then it's great. You know, it's, it's, we're, 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 we take those calls. As soon as they come through, we always set it up. Um, we're also kind of being active. You know, we, we listen to shows. We talk to the creators of shows that we think are sometimes underappreciated or their show got lost in the shuffle because of the way that they, the company they worked for put it out. You know, that happens a lot. Um, I think with shows. So, and I think a lot of podcast creators are are really refreshed to hear this idea that they that they they are the talent, and that they're not just like another person in the in the machinery of it, and that we want to treat them as a partner, as a real creator. You know, what kind of operational infrastructure are you building up? Like, do you have a podcast full time podcast producer, a full time ad salesperson, a partnerships person? We have we have a whole kind of constellation of people who are doing different jobs, and and it's kind of like a truly post COVID sort of millennial leaning company right now. Whereas a lot of people I find that, you know everyone's quitting their jobs and stuff. Have you read in the news? And and when people quit their jobs, they don't want to jump into another full time job. They want to do so. We have people doing like three days with us and two days with somebody else, or or the other way around, two days with us and three days somewhere else. And it, we're finding it really works well because it, it creates a kind of lean mentality. Everyone's kind of refreshed because they come from one job to another, and it's like something different than what they're used to. And then we have all these other partnerships. Obviously, PRX is doing ads for Fat Leonard, and potentially they'll do that for some of our future podcasts. So we're trying to be focus on 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 the on the IP, the content, as, as, and that's the kind of key. And then everything else, we've got all the relationships in place. You know, whether it's accounting and payroll and all that stuff, it's all all set up to to make it easy for people. Given that you are, you know, some of the key creative talent both from lending your voice to other projects plus you know working on your own how much do you do you do you see yourself like eventually hiring a ceo or somebody who's like 100% business focused so you could focus more on the content yeah it's hard to say you know at this stage um and and we have so many ideas all the time you know about new directions to go and new businesses i, I don't know it's, we'll we'll sort of just be very organic about it for the time being we have there's Tom and I, we have two advisors who are kind of from the business world that we really, we, we lean on a lot. Um, and we have, you know, another thing, we have really great lawyers that we think are actually really great guides for us. Um, I think probably the next thing we would need is somebody who can just help us organize all the, because we're going to go from one project last year to, to you know, six to 10 this year. So it's, it's a lot to keep, keep, in the, keep all the kind of, you know, wheels turning and everything organized, but we'll see. Do you ever see yourself becoming a more traditional media company where you're publishing content on a daily basis or a weekly basis? Like it sounds like right now you're only taking like 
book length or season length type projects, but what if someone comes with an idea for a good 5,000 word story or something like that? Yeah, I, I think I would be super open to hearing any project that is kind of narrative or or ambitious or interesting in, in the way that it's going to be told. Like I really, I'm really interested in the idea of becoming a independent audiobook publisher. I think it's, I think audiobooks are really refreshing sometimes after you listen to a lot of podcasts. They're, they're remarkably clear. You know, you can really visualize actually. Um, we're also interested in fiction podcasts where we're, we're um, preparing one that could come out later this year of our own creation. Um, we, we, um, we, and the other thing is about newsletters. You know, we started a newsletter called Whale Hunting, which is kind of inspired by Billion Dollar Whale. And um, it's a really great way to connect with your community and with your audience. You know, when you, a, a podcast is a very intimate experience. And I think that's what makes them so special is that you really feel like you're there. You're, you're with the, the, the narrator or the journalist. And so I think that all of these things can work together. So like, for example, we, we have this whale hunting newsletter. We want to make that into a podcast that will start in, in, a, in a month or so. We want to, for, for these new franchises in the future, there may be a newsletter associated with them that sort of keeps the, the you know, keeps supplying something to the people who really like that point of view. And so I think you'll see from us a lot of things that come at different cadences and, and there'll be sort of a spectrum from, you know, newsletters that are relatively easy up to fully you know, produced eight part, 10 part series. So whale hunting, that's like what focused on like international finance fraud, stuff like that. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like, we, we like to think of it as how the world really works, you know? And so one of the things we're doing right now is called the rich list. It's a kind of live investigation where we're, where the, the idea is that the richest person on earth isn't Jeff Bezos. Everyone secretly knows that at the, at the kind of high levels of finance and government, because those lists, those Forbes lists and things don't include heads of state, criminals, people who have truly private wealth that can't be easily ascertained. And, and we said in, the, in, in an addition today about Putin that all that hidden wealth is kind of like dark matter in the universe. And it's sort of like warping time and space, but you can't see it. And so th the idea behind this rich list, which is just part of whale hunting, is to kind of just shed a little bit of light on those people and, and, and what, the, what kind of things they get up to. So that's kind of like an ongoing media thing that isn't really tied to a single story then. So it sounds like you already sort of are in that space. Yeah, we're in that space and, and the podcast will be, will have similar, you know, a, a similar approach and maybe it might be a little bit different than the newsletter. It might have different kind of discussions. Um, and then we're also going to start experimenting with short documentaries. Um, I've just been so thrilled to, to, to kind of explore these like short YouTube documentaries. I think it's just, you know, people want it. You know, if you look at these documentaries, they have two, three million, three million um, views. And I just think it's a good space for someone like us to operate in because we have, we're, we're overwhelmed with great stories and we need to think of different ways to bring them out. And they can't all come out as like a six part, eight part series. Sometimes it makes sense to do a 10 minute documentary, or sometimes it makes sense to do a 5,000 word newsletter entry. I guess I just wonder, like with the YouTube, with like, especially with YouTube, what I know about YouTube economics is like, you, you need like a, in order to start making real money on YouTube, you have to have like a huge backlog of content that's like passively generating a lot of views every month. And like two or 3 million views won't actually generate that much revenue by itself. Like, what do you like in some of this stuff? I'm just wondering about scale and the need to hit it in order to hit those like revenue figures where if you're doing on a project by project basis, it like revenue can be inconsistent and it's hard to predict hits in advance. Is this anything that you kind of think about or worry about? Oh yeah, for sure. And and, and this is why I said about like Substack and things like that too. And we actually don't use Substack. We use Ghost, which is a, which is another kind of a nonprofit platform. That that's just as an aside. Uh, one of our philosophies is that if we're going to use technology to put things out, we'd rather use nonprofits like PRX, Ghost, because we don't want to become sort of gobbled up by another media empire. Like, what what's the Substack media empire look like in five years from now, and and how do we fit into that? You know. Mm -hmm. Anyways, but putting that aside, the the key is not to think about any of these things as a as a single project. So, like, if you have a let's say that you have a a podcast franchise that has two or three shows a year, plus maybe some other like super short, limited topical discussions. You have a newsletter associated with it. Maybe you do a, 
one or two short documentaries a year. It's all the same grouping of things. And you can actually even look at them as marketing related too. You know, so you're you're just trying to make sure that people know what this is about, what this worldview is, and you want them to subscribe and just be connected to it. And that connection with the audience, the and the interaction with the audience is the is the crucial component, and that will start to yield um, a return that that actually makes sense. But if you do any one of those things, if you just started YouTube documentaries, or you just did a podcast, or you just did a newsletter, it won't add up to enough to make it work. That's my opinion. So you think that you'll be producing at enough, uh, qu quick enough pace across different platforms that you can get some network effects and cross promotion and different stuff like that? Yeah, like let's say that we we have this really we have this really exciting podcast we're working on that's going to come out. I told you in two languages. Like it would make sense for us to make a short documentary about that because what if, if it, first of all, when you listen to a podcast, you don't you can't visualize the people very well. So it's actually nice to start. A podcast with getting a couple of images in your face, like uh, of faces of what people look like in some of the settings. So we, we thought we could do a short documentary is almost like a, a longer version of a trailer that builds interest in the podcast. You know, it, it all kind of adds up together in a way that makes sense. And you may even derive revenue from the documentary itself, you know, but it, you can't, you can't make it thinking that, that that's going to work by itself. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Okay, Bradley. Well, those were all the questions I had for you. Where can people find you online? You can find us at projectbrazen.com. I'm on Twitter, um, Bradley Hope, and check out our, our newsletter, Whale Hunting, um, and there'll be a lot more to come. Okay. This is a lot of fun. Thanks for joining me. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for joining us. I'm actually on the lookout for new guests for this podcast. So if you do interesting stuff in digital content, whether you're a full-time YouTuber, a media executive, or run a cool niche newsletter, definitely reach out. My email address is simonowens at gmail.com. Okay, see you next week.